Uh, shall we start now, sir? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can start. Okay. Namaste, good afternoon, and warm welcome to all of you on 24th Architects Speak, organized by SONA, SONA Committee for Professional Practice. This is architect Sarita Amartya Shrestha, your moderator for the program. Once again, I would like to welcome you all in the program. To, is, uh, it is sure that we are go going to have a very interesting program today, and surely we'll have some questions for our speaker. So I would like to kindly like to request all the participants to put in their questions in the question answer box given uh, in the Zoom. So, uh, uh, and I would also like to thank all the participants for being here with us. Thank you once again. And yes, disaster is the term that is really, uh, that brings goosebumps, uh, of course. We have felt it, we have uh, felt its terror. But there is this slight light of hope with disaster risk management. Disaster risk management, it is a multidisciplinary field and ma many more professionals are involved in it and their, their expertise is always there. And one of them is an architect. Yes, we are very lucky today to have with us such an architect who have uh, given his expertise in disaster, disaster management. We have been honestly waiting for this moment, and today we are here with one of the top uh, leading architects of India, Dr. Beni Kuriakus. So we are so glad and so privileged to have your valued presence, sir. Thank you very much for being here with us. And, you, uh, and we would like to heartily welcome you, sir. You're most welcome to our program. Okay, thank you, Sweeta. I'll... Uh... Uh, Start or uh, uh, no, sir. Uh, please give me a pleasure to give your brief introduction to. Uh, may I proceed, sir? Yeah, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Vernacular architecture being climate responsive uses locally available materials, safe projects to simplistic beauty. This is the belief. This is the th thought of Dr. Beni, and it's a. This is the exact thing that he has been inc incorporating in his designs. This is the region that he has been listed in the top 10 list of architect for harnessing the traditional process. And Bailey sir also says that it's journey, what, he, what you take matter to be successful. This is a really inspiring uh, line, sir. <laughs> yes, it's a journey that you take makes you successful. And now we'll have a slide view on his journey towards architecture. He started his journey in architecture in 1984. Holding a degree in civil engineering, he paved a very successful path in architecture after meet, meeting the um, master architect, Laurie Baker. He considered him as his inspiration and mentor too. Dr. Bainey also uh, believes in that architects should write. Yes, you heard me right. Architects should write. And, uh, uh, and he has so written many books. And one of the book is like Laurie uh, Baker with children. And uh, this may be one of his uh, way of expressing the gratitude towards his mentors. So also, we are with really humble person too. So he started working with him for nine months. After that, he started to work on his own. And that, that really followed with number of various projects and not only the project, inspiring project that brought him many recognitions. And considering his projects, there are residences, resorts, rehabilitation projects, heritage conservation projects. And there are lots of lot of lists that has to be explained. So I'm taking some few of his projects to explain. I'm really honored to uh, uh, explain uh, explain his some of the projects. Uh, it is like Mamuti's house. That's a actor's house, right, sir? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Bini sir is also interested. Was a and still interested, I hope, in the photography from the very beginning. And yes, among his many prestigious 
heritage project. One of the important project is Mujiri's heritage project. He has uh, in 2008. He has other uh, project Anantya Resort, Vayanat House, Haristri Vidyalam, Institute of Palliative Medicine, Dakshin Chitra Theme Village. And in all these all this things, we can feel his uh, essence for the vernacular architecture. Those large verandas, those courtyards, those uh, windows, those locally available materials juxtaposed so, so beautifully, like stones, stones, brick, and timbers. These are the quality and the fine ability of Dr. Bini, who has shaped the vernacular architecture into the modern houses. And the roof, of course, will act like a veil to the veil of a bride that really beautifies his buildings and really inspiring. And concerning his involvement in disaster management project, he has been involved in rehabilitation project for the earthquake victims of Banigao Phillies Latour in 1994. And in 2002, he has been involved in rehabilitation project for the earthquake victim of Chapredi Village, Puj. And 2006, he has been involved in reconstruction of the tsunami affected villages of Taragambadi and Chinangudi. These are the projects that he has, been, has carried out. These are the only few projects, let me remind you of this. And yes, it was followed by a number of awards. Let me have an honor to uh, mention those awards with you all. Charles Lalek India Trust Award. He had received this award in his master's in 1986. In 2002, he has been awarded with Designer of the Year Award by Inside Outside Magazine. In 2011, he has been awarded with Celebration of Architecture Award by Inside Outside Magazine. Again, and he has been awarded with Lifetime Achievement Award. This is the award that everyone would be uh, owning for. Yes, he has achieved it, Lifetime Achievement Award by Stretz. In 2017, he scrolls of honor, 2017 by Reality Plus. And in 2017, again, he has been awarded with Editor's Choice for Exemplary Body of work, Works, Trained Excellency Award. Now, with number of these awards, we may be thinking that he is only uh, one of the top architect. It's not really true. He, he hides many more ability within himself and inspiring all of us. He is, of course, an author of the books. He is an editor. He, he has made a, a very important appearance in different seminars, presentation, and conferences. So we are here with such a uh, exemplary and very much phenomenal architect with us who have intense love for the vernacular architecture, who has marked the very important uh, place in the heritage conservation in his own place, who itself is, who himself is one of the inspiration to all of us. We are so much honored to have you over here, sir. Once again, we would like to welcome you heartily in the program. And with this, I would also like to request again to all the participants to put in their questions in the question answer box. Sir, it's an honor to give your uh, brief introduction. There are many, many much more achievements you have done. I have took very few one, a few much only. And uh, now I would humbly like to request you to take the floor and share your slides, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you Sita, for the very kind words. I don't know whether I deserve all those things, but uh, 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 I would like to thank Society of Nepalese Architects for giving me an opportunity to, opportunity to talk about this project, I mean, this uh, topic. Uh, I will straight away go to my presentation. So as uh, Sweeta has already said, it will be nice if everybody can post the questions in the question-answer session, then it will be uh, much, much easier to do. Okay, let me just... Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. it's visible. Okay, I'll just start with the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, uh, 
I mean, the topic is disaster management and the role of architects. And uh, uh, when it comes to the role of architects, I, every time it rem reminds me of the statement made by David Sanderson, who is an architect, he's not a, I mean, who is an architect, who is a professor of architecture from the University of S S New South Wales. What he has said is that architects are the last people needed in post-disaster reconstruction as their traditional no role and knowledge in the building industry is inappropriate for humanitarian responses. What his argument is that they are inappropriate, the training is not good, or the training, I mean, this criticism, not only David Sanderson has put, there are many others which, who have made similar arguments and many of the projects architects are not involved or they might just do the overall site layout or they might just overall uh, do a one typical plan of one house and it is multiplied 500 times or 1000 times depending on the number of the houses. And uh, I mean, I went through the article which is available in the internet so I'm just trying to tell what he's trying to t tell in the article. One is that he said, most of the architects focus on buildings rather than the people, which means that people are very, very important. So they focus on the buildings. And then the second aspect is one of the point he's trying to make in the article, architects are taught to focus on the product, that is the building, whereas for this disaster, relief work or the reconstruction work or the rehabilitation work, according to him, the process is also equally important. You see, this, uh, he has written the article, as I said, in 2010, if my memory is correct. And uh, that is what he has said. And also he continues to say in the same article that too many aid delivered shelter programs, because one of the things which happens in third world countries or less developed countries is that when a disaster sets in, all these kinds of international NGOs, international organization, they just come and they give money or they give the aid some, I mean, more, I mean it happens in, uh, uh, in many of the projects. I, I worked on four redesigning of four villages or towns in which two were funded by international agencies. So they just come. And uh, so what he says is that too many of these aid delivered shelter programs have lacked genuine participation by affected people. The people who are affected doesn't have a say in these projects. That is what he says. And as a result, what happens is that most of these houses are very poorly designed. The location is wrong. Of course, it is true in many of these villages when the new villages are being rebuilt I mean, people don't refuse to occupy those places. In Gujarat, it has happened. It has happened in Maharashtra. What he's trying to argue is that the affected people should be seen as human beings. This is what he says. Now, the, what I'm trying to go through the article today, I mean, no, not the article, the presentation today is try to look at what role can architects play or what role can professionals play? Is it true that they just design only the buildings? So I'm just giving a case study of a project. But before we go much into the uh, case study as such, I would like to give, there are certain misconceptions about disasters, which I have also come across while I worked on these four projects. I also wrote a book on the Kerala floods two years ago. Uh, when I mean less than two years ago, and it's available in my website, uh, which is there. There are a lot of misconceptions. So one of the misconceptions is that disasters come once in a while. I found this attitude among the politicians as well as the bureaucrats and the other people who are involved. I mean, this will happen once in 10 years, once in 20 years, and uh, it, it will come once in a while. I mean, that is the attitude. That is the attitude. Now, if you look at this, this is a study report which says that disasters are on the increase. I mean, the scale shows, I mean, it, where various colors are used because this is a map which is sourced from Munich Ray and uh, earthquakes are marked in this, storms are marked in this, floods are marked in. So if you can just see that over a period of time from 1980, I mean, this, uh, this last data might be 2016, you can see that steady increase in the number of disasters. 
Now, although the disasters are on the increase, uh, the human casualties might be on the decrease. You understand and what I'm trying to make. The property loss, the resources loss is on the higher side. The number of people who die in each of the disasters have come down. Now, there is many of the areas which have never been affected by a disaster are being affected these days. For example, east coast of India, the cyclones are very common all these years, but west coast, we never used to have cyclones. But for the last four or five years, we had at least two or three major cyclones coming up and hitting the west coast. So all these things are happening as part of these things. So when you try to dismiss, for example, why I'm particular about this is that disasters will come again. For example, the Kerala floods, the last major flood which we had in the last century was in 1924. And 2018, we had a major flood. So which 2018, that almost 100 years, 1924 to 2018. And the 2018 flood in most of the places reached a higher level than the 1924 flood. So that is what has happened. So at that time, many of the uh, people said that, no, we don't have to worry about the next disaster for the next 100 years, which, was a, which is a very, very wrong concept. But 2019, again, we had floods. Might not be the extent of the 2018 damage, but still it was a major flood, which, is, which has come and affected so many people and affected so many houses. Now, this is a data, I mean, I'm, I'm, which is published by the courts, I mean, published by the federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA in US. This is, they take care of the disasters in US and uh, they have published a coastal construction manual I've just taken. So what it says is that even if it is a have once in say 100 year event like the Kerala floods, but still to happen it in one, next one year, there is one person chance to happen, repeat it in the next 10 years, there is a 10 person chance. And that is what you saw the floods coming again in 2019. So when the floods came in 2019 in Kerala, which is on the southwest part of India, people expected 2020 will have floods, but so far we have not received any uh, major floods, but it can come again next year or two years later. So the disasters, we, we are not able to predict what is the frequency of disasters. One thing is very clear, disasters are on the increase, various studies and statistics. Now this, attitude of certain things happening once in 100 years has led to the thing that we worry about disasters once it happens, which is a very, very wrong attitude. We take that we need not do any preparedness for disasters. That is the attitude. It's a misconception. We need not plan for future floods. I mean, that is there. I mean, Kerala, when the floods came in 2018, I will say as a this thing that the Kerala government and many other people did not bother to look at what will happen if another floods comes in 2019 or 2025, the floods can become even more severe than the 2018 one. Now I'm just putting some old statistics. There was a, a earthquake of 7.1 magnitude, Richter scale, you people in Nepal will be very aware of this thing, 1989. This quake killed 62 people in Central California, 1989. Similarly, March 20, 2005, Richter scale seven, there was a quake which killed at least one person. That is uh, what uh, the newspaper reports came, but injured more than 400 people. But there was the Latour earthquake was 6.4 in density. It led to the death of 20,000 people. So when an earthquake happens in a, Western world or the developed countries like US or Japan or uh, this thing, the magnitude of the human casualty is much less. When the earthquake of a similar intensity happens in Latin America or in Nepal or India, the number of casualties are much more. Oh, I mean, Chile, Peru, all those areas are uh, very much susceptible to earthquakes. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, as part of this. So why is it happening? Why is when an earthquake of intensity seven hits Japan, only one person dies? 
why is it same intensity earthquake happens in India? Why do so many people die? This question is very, very clear. They do disaster preparedness. They make sure that the buildings they construct are take care of the earthquake uh, prevention measures and all those things. That is one, one thing which, so the imp very, very important to have proper disaster preparedness. The buildings that we construct uh, as part of the uh, disaster rehabilitation project should be able to take care of these things. Now, when it comes to certain things like floods, for exa example, global warming is a reality. For example, the Kerala floods, one of the problems is that sea level is going to rise by one meter, means floods are going to be very frequent in the future in Kerala or similar places because the sea, the Kerala is a small state. There are 44 rivers. The water will not be able to empty into the into the sea very easily if the sea water level rises. So there will be very frequent floods. Also, according to the climate change and the global warming, and as a result, we get heavy rains in a short spell. This is also one of the realities which is happening during the last one or one decade or two decades. And we have we have failed quite a bit in controlling the global warming. The important thing about the global warming, even if it happens in any countries in the world, still it happens with the, uh, so any, any country, anywhere it can happen. So the global warming is a reality. It, we have to understand that we will not be able to have the NOAA's ark or the NOAA's ship or kind where we can escape because the population is very high. And uh, it is uh, very, very difficult for us to I mean, convert into amphibians or, I mean, we said that uh, Darwin says that from monkeys, we have come to human beings and we won't be able to survive in water or we will be able to be amphibians. It is impossible for us to do. Now, if you look at that, I'm just giving it, uh, the statistics might vary every year, but 30 million people displaced every year by disasters on an average. I mean, this is the UN statistics from one of the reports. And 30 million is a big number. I mean, it's not a small number. It's a, uh, quite a big, uh, big, big number, which is there. I mean, it's for example, 30 million will be say, 2% of the world's population gets affected every year. So you can just imagine uh, every year, the uh, uh, every year the people get affected. Now, when you look at most of these things, it, you will find that the poor are the most vulnerable in disasters because they live in, uh, bad quality buildings because they are able not able to maintain the buildings. So even if they construct a building, I mean, they are not able to construct it with very good quality construction. So the quality of the buildings, uh, our quality of construction comes very low. So the durability of the building is get affected. So they might have constructed house 20 years ago, but now they are vulnerable to the disaster. So it's the poor population. They do not, do not have insurance. They do not have bank balance and they put all their savings into the buildings and food and clothing, so they don't have. So it's very, very important that uh, the governments or all these people have to take this into account. Now I'm just here, I'm just trying to bring in two statements, like uh, uh, one statement by Sanderson. He says that buildings fell down because of poor maintenance, because poor quality of construction, lack of planning and mismanagement. What he means by mismanagement, it have been constructed at the wrong place. I mean, you construct in a area which is vulnerable to landslides. You construct in a place which is vulnerable to future floods or you construct a building in a flood plain. So all these things, lack of planning, poor maintenance. This is where the expert knowledge becomes very, very important. How can we make sure that when we reconstruct after a disaster, how can we make sure that our buildings are safer? We are able to uh, reduce the casualties. We are able to reduce the property loss. I gave a clear example how Japan, when, it, when intensity of seven comes, only one or two people die. It's the same thing, California is an earthquake zone. There also the number of people die in an earthquake of the same intensity is much, much lesser but here the things is uh, very, very, uh, in developed countries, it will be very, very, uh, it's very different. Now, if we, we were, uh, Salvano also have mentioned that it is poverty that, that is at the core of the disasters. So, I mean, it's not, it's not an issue which can be dealt with one disaster, it has to be dealt with over a long period of time. 
governments need to have a long term strategy short term strategies will not work and especially when it comes to people uh, from the third world countries or the less developed countries shelter is more than just a building it is a home and the stress caused by the disaster is huge all these people whether it's rich or poor everybody is affected but uh, poor is more affected the casualties or the uh, these things are taken by mostly by the poor people the stress cost is very high so we have to consider these things uh, and when uh, once the stress comes see one of the things for the things is that the reconstruction is a slow process but once the damage comes i mean you see in every disaster the government and everybody wants to do speedy construction the problem with the speedy construction if you cannot ensure the quality of construction then it will be a, it will be vulnerable to a future disaster so the quality of construction is very important also you have to study you have, you need to do proper planning so it just don't reconstruct in the same place because if it is uh, again susceptible to a future disaster uh, i mean the people who construct houses or people who are going to live in those houses doesn't know about it so if we have to look at whether an area is vulnerable with landslides or whether we are constructing the house again in a flat plain uh, this is this is required so the normal strategy is that we should go for uh, uh, the temporary shelters and that is what what is required now i'm just trying to do what is the role which architects can play or the professionals can can play in such a kind of uh, sequence now the one of the things problems of course in india i don't know about the nepal situation in india there are strict guidelines on the earthquake constructions how to take the take care of the earthquakes we are divided into different zones zone 5 zone 4 zone 3 etc in each area you have to uh do according to the requirements for example when i worked in the banigam village in latur earthquake uh, earthquake intensity of 6.4 came and 20000 people died uh but the houses had never followed any earthquake precautions because it was in zone 2 which is um, there very little chance now after the earthquake came it was converted it was re re reassigned as a zone 4 so i mean it can happen i mean this is the this is the way the disasters i mean as i told about the kerala example a uh, flood came in 1924 and after that i mean a uh, flood in we had to wait till 2018 to get a flood of the similar this thing but uh, in india you can see there are so many structural codes and earthquake resistant so many revisions have happened but there are two three two three things which is where there are no guidelines or building codes for landslides and floods even in india even at the stage so but it is a very common occurrence in india as well there are i mean yeah I, there are no standard guidelines and measures that is to be taken we just take some of these things for granted and allow these things to come again every year but what we it's time that the policy makers the government the bureaucrats and the professionals everybody has to take a step towards these things of making the uh, uh making the guidelines or codes or trying to study these areas in detail now i'll just try to give say two three slides on these things when it comes to reconstruction house is a customized product it has many dimensions cultural dimensions economic dimensions technical dimensions political dimensions and as sanders and has said the process of making the customized product is also equally important it is not the end product alone which is happening now we have so many mass housing projects i mean i mean from the 50s 60 70s onwards one of the i mean i'm just some of the drawbacks you can categorize one is that they were matchbox like appearance they look like matchboxes because if 1000 houses have to be constructed it is one design into 1000 which is a drawback major drawback and so many people have criticized such kind of an approach so many architects so many housing planners and uh, one of the famous architects who have criticized it in the i mean he has worked in latin america in the 1960s and uh, i mean he, he has written two books i mean one book which is famous housing by people the same argument which david sanders and he has put forward in the 
I mean, the book was published in 1973, if my memory is correct. And he is also edited in which he has written one article, Freedom to Build. I mean, he has done it based on his experience in the Latin American countries where he has worked. He's a Britisher, but worked in Latin America. So, and what he is trying to say is that house owners do not have a say in the houses they are going to leave. This is one of the major drawbacks. That is why he, he gave the title, Housing by People and the Freedom to Build, two of the books he was involved with, he has written about. And uh, standard designs of one or two types, which is that people are not, each person is different, each person is unique, but uh, unfortunately we use standard designs. And um, I would like to put forward these four, three principles, which are very, very important when you try to do any housing project, whether it's a reconstruction or a new housing project, participation of the people in the layout of the village, design of the house and the construction is to be ensured for the project to be successful. Participation of the affected people or the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries should have an ownership feeling. If they are involved, they will have an ownership feeling. So it has to be built into the overall housing process because all these projects which are being done now, the beneficiaries are no way involved. They are nowhere in the picture. Some big contractor comes and construct these thousand houses and they are allotted the houses once it is over. They will never have an ownership feeling if you do like this. So the beneficiaries should have an ownership feeling. And also another problem, all these people, depending on wherever people live in each of the areas, there are so many social and cultural aspects of the people concerned, which should be taken into account while planning these houses. And when some architect makes a, sits down in the London office and draws the plan of a village in Nepal of a thousand houses or 500 houses to be reconstructed, none of these things gets, get any priority. So this, is, this aspect is, uh, is very, very important. Now I'm just going to give a case study where I was involved in the tsunami reconstruction. We have done about uh, more than 1,000 houses in a town called the Tarangambadi. Uh, Trankoba, it is a Danish settlement. The old houses, the historic part was not very much damaged. There is an old fort there, Danish fort. It is the biggest fort outside Denmark. Second biggest fort, second biggest Danish fort as well. And it is in this town. And uh, so uh, I was asked to do the design of two of the projects. Uh, one is in Trankoba and the other one is Chinnangudi, which is a small uh, village. Trankabar, there was about 1,500 houses. And in uh, Chinnangudi, which is another fisherman's, both are fishermen's elements because the tsunami was the disaster. So Chinnangudi, there might have been about 530, 530 houses or something. I mean, this is that. So we just discussed with the houses. So this is the meeting we had. I mean, tsunami happened 26th December, 2004. And uh, we just, uh, uh, I mean, the, so 2005, we had the meeting. So what we did is very simple. We did an initial analysis of the tsunami damages. That was the first exercise. And we shared with the community that this is, this is what has happened to the community. These are the houses which were damaged. The houses which had built on uh, low-lying areas, uh, wetlands were damaged more. The houses which were built on the high areas did not get damaged. We took the contour mapping, we did a detailed survey, we talked with every family, tried to collect the details of every family, and we did a safety and vulnerability of the old and the new sites. Because government decided that they will construct a new village also. So there was a lot of opposition. Fishermen said that we want to be near the sea, so we cannot move because the new village which was acquired by the government. We didn't have any say when we were asked to plan this. Government has already acquired the land and said that you have to construct the new houses there. And there were some people who wanted to stay in the old village, so the village was getting split into two. Now, what we tried to do was that we had to gain some time. People are living in temporary houses. So we con constructed seven model houses, with each with, with a different plan. So. We told the beneficiaries, you can choose any of these houses, any of these plants, and uh, that is what we did. We did conduct a survey on each of the individuals, housing preferences, what kind of house you want, what is your concept about a house. You know, the fisherman was 
i will say architecturally illiterate so they did not know they will come and say something in the morning the next day evening they will come and say no uh, i want something like this that is why we found it right at the beginning that's why we did model building so they can go and see these buildings and choose one of them because uh, if it was a literate architecturally literate community then it would have been very very uh, different and uh, we took up option of replanning either in situ or reloc they can relocate to the new village we we say because there are certain areas of the village are safe existing village is safe they need not relocate to the thing and this is the dialogue we had with the community i will explain it in a bit later so we did this thing this is the chinnagudi we did i mean the roads i mean it's a detailed study there is a the study is in my website as a book we published as a book uh anybody can go to my website and download this we started to uh, did a study of the houses which were pakka pakka means in indian is this solid good quality construction semi pakka semi good quality construction kacha means very temporary i mean they use thatch houses or houses built with mud or very very inferior quality material so the flooring will be very bad so this is the definition used in india uh and this is also the pakka so we just took a study of how this we also looked at the roofing material we looked at the flooring material walling material we also try to look at although the house some of the houses were completely destroyed we just try to measure the area of the house because we met each of the beneficiary and they said this is the area of the house i mean so they were able to look at some traces of the old house was still there so we found that most of the houses is Big, bigger than the 325 why is, i will tell you why the 325 square feet becomes important is that dunman has said that all the new houses should be 325 square feet so those who are 250 square feet will get a 325 square feet those who are 1000 square feet house will also get only a 325 square feet house and because government stipulated the norms as soon as the disaster is over the government had a committee it came as a go or the government order so we found that most of the village houses had more than 325 square feet which prompted us even if we give the house they will make extension to these houses we did a survey on the houses we just asked them who does who wants to move into the new village who don't want to move into the new village and to our surprise we found that most of the people want to move into the new village so we just because our team was very strong in the working with the community Uh, i mean it consisted of architects and engineers and social workers and all those people and uh, one of the things we found out was that the intention of most of the people moving out into the new location was to retain the old house as well as build a new get a new house in the new location so their demand was this thing which we thought was uh, not correct uh, so that is why most of those people want to move into the so because initially they said we don't want to move into the new villages because we need to be closer we are fishermen we need to be closer to the sea so we found did some studies i'll quickly run through it one is that they had a puja room because their life is very insecure they go into the sea i mean um, uh, i mean uh, even when we did in 2005 when we did these studies many of the boats were not mechanized so they just go uh, they go deep into the sea so there is no guarantee that they will come back they consider sea as their mother mother sea i mean they pray to mother sea always i mean in nepal it might be the mountains who will be considered as the mother or the father so here the thing is that the puja room was a must because that is very important even if the house had only four rooms one of the room is a puja room they had firewood stove always faces east water storage is important because the ground water is saline and uh, some houses have poultry and goat so we have to take care of those and we found that some of the most of the houses are facing north or south and villages want an outdoor kitchen because most of those houses is built with thatch so and these houses were in a high density situation these houses were so close by so one house catches fire which is a thatch roof then the fire will spread to the nearby houses very fast so they used to have an outdoor kitchen which was there in most of the houses and there were hardly a few toilets in the village very few toilets but it is important to give and acute shortage of drinking water 
and there there was a gunman housing scheme in 20 years ago even those houses were very badly damaged so they said we don't want because you know a contractor comes and construct in this particular case it might not be a general case but i've seen many of the projects after 15 years 20 years start leaking and the pit, it is in a pitiable condition so they said we don't want government houses so the work was done with international aid mainly swiss red cross india and it was came through a local ngo which is called the south indian fishermen a federation of fishermen societies so we try to look at the damage which happened before tsunami after tsunami and this is the new location site when we got the site and the rains came in the october number season we found that the entire new site is flooded with water i mean this is in chinnangudi village and we did some studies and we found i mean the what you see on the left which is completely red that was the area where the new village is located and we looked to study the old village with the houses we did the study according to our study water came up to 2.8 meter rise from the sea water level and we found that the water has not reached the center of the village you can see a small green patch in the center of the village so that is the no risk area if 2.8 meter water rise from the sea level i mean water will not reach that green patch low risk area what we consider is 2 feet of water and that yellow patch no water will come so that which means that area is elevated by more than 2 meters from the uh, from the sea water level and the orange area i mean it's uh, more dangerous and high risk area means that uh, uh, it the water comes to more than 6 feet high i mean you won't be if you don't know swimming you die and so what the existing village plan shows that instead of building a house in the new village it is better to construct a village a house in the existing village some areas are quite safe compared with that so but they had this fear towards the tsunami so we just did the so the, and also our studies this is the similar map we did 2.1 meter water comes more area is safer so we dialogue this with the community our engineers and architects dialogue with the community told them each one told them this is the risk which you are involved with so you might not have to shift you might have to shift we just so if only 1 meter water rises still i um, mean most of the areas are safe and even the existing village this is tarangambadi village and uh, what happens in the existing village is rain comes really raining rainy season this is not tsunami or floods the streets become like water bodies this is what happens in this thing and uh, i mean we are not started the reconstruction but uh, we had collected huge river sand quantities you can see i mean uh, the water this road was completely this is a photograph i took when i heard about the heavy rainfall so this floods is yearly occurrence tsunami is something which has come once in a while but floods come every year so the water comes like a normal height after the year after tsunami and they were living in temporary shelter so this is what happens you can see the level to which water has come by because i was in chennai when the uh, rains came and the floods came so i rushed to the place by that time the water table i mean the water has receded so we have to look at the site selection because we said that what is the pointing in giving them the house which gets flooded every year it's a golden opportunity we are reconstructing the houses by spending so much amount of money why can't we make the houses safe against floods as well or against future cyclones as well so this is what we did so we decided to raise the ground level because some people wanted to stay so uh, we are, and we had to we had to study the land filling and its impact what 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 is the impact of the land filling we tried to study that and uh, we also looked at the earlier question i said why is why people who had even bigger houses in the village wants to get a new house we found the dual house theory which we did not want to promote so we told them if you want to get a new house in the new village then you have to demolish you have to give you a right to the old house so which some people did so the whole initially 95% of the people wanted to move to the new location we found that say 70% or uh, or 50% wanted to retain the houses in the old village so because their houses in the old village was bigger their plot was bigger so we just found this house and uh, when as i said here this shows the number of 
uh, bad quality houses. I mean, 24% were kacha houses, very poor quality houses. Pakka houses were 38%. And many of the Pakka houses survived in, the, in, in each of these things. And we took the certain planning decisions and designing decisions. We wanted that every family is unique and we wanted them to be consulted, which was not very easy. We wanted to bring in the human touch with David Sanders. And you know, this project happened in 2005, 2006. David Sanders wrote the article much after we did this project. But we wanted to take certain decisions and it's a huge project. In Tarangambadi, we had to construct, I um, mean, total number of houses is 2000. We had to construct 1500 houses was the initial target, which is a huge project. And we decided not to go with a big contractor. I shifted my office from the town to the village. Our whole team worked in the village because when you work in the village, you come to know about the pulse of the uh, villagers and their discussions. What we did is we, this, uh, we formed clusters, divided into clusters, 25 to 50 houses is one cluster. If it is 25 houses, it's around 7,000 square feet. If it is 50 houses, it is around 50, 15,000 square feet of construction, which is like doing a thing. So we allocated an engineer, one social worker, and one architect for each of the clusters. This is what we did in this project. And what we said that our, uh, I mean, Sanderson says our traditional knowledge of architecture is not enough. The traditional knowledge of the builders, uh, our engineers are also not enough. What we needed is a, typical old craftsman in our old villages, our villages, which in India we call them Stabadis, the master craftsman. He is, he, he is an engineer, he is an architect, he is a builder. So we said there is no provision in the building industry anywhere in the world where person, it becomes the, a person becomes the master craftsman. So we said this is not there. That is why we tried to compensate it by allocating an engineer, an architect, and a social worker to us. Engineers and architects might not be good at dialoguing with the community. So we just, this is the model. So we divide into clusters and that is what we did. So we wanted to, we gave training programs to all these people, how to dialogue with the community. And we said 2000 different designs and our strategy was very simple. We made some savings in the design of the houses. So if the three lakhs rupees was the cost of the one house, we allocated three lakh 50,000 rupees. So if uh, what we said, 15,000 is their choice. They can have more shelves, they can have a veranda, they can have a built-in seat or built-in bed, which we gave them the choice. There were, toilet was not a compromise, but veranda was a compromise. Because we knew that even if we don't give a veranda, they will construct a veranda with temporary materials. So this is what, so we try to give them to choose that detail. So we, which means that each house was designed separately, customized, and we try to control the cost by giving them, some people want a kitchen shelf, some people want shelves in the bedroom. So depending on each of them, we use that 50,000 rupees extra for developing all these things. These are the dialogues which we had with the community we constructed a place because we had a team of about 100 people to construct this project. So we had, this is our, uh, we call it 24 hour coffee shop. What you see on the left hand side with that roof is our training center. And uh, we had very lot of consultations with foreign architects because the Swiss Red Cross was one of the major funders. So they, they came. So we had uh, consultations with various people, professionals, various disciplines. For example, one of the person is a uh, uh, environmentalist, housing experts, engineers, sociologists. Uh, so we had landscape architects. So we had people from various, we consulted, we presented our programs, we fine tuned our programs, we started the construction and the construction. And we made sure that the construction, the house is allocated both to the husband and wife. That is one is Velu, what is written in Tamil, the other is Mutilashmi. We said that the house will be given only. We try to make sure that the social justice and equal, equity and uh, equality and uh, gender uh, things were taken care of. The TC means Tarangambadi cluster. 16 is the cluster number and five is the house. So we had to do this process of customizing only if we allot the houses. And out of the 
70 projects which were done in Tamil Nadu, we were the, these two villages, only the two villages where the house owners were allotted before the construction of the house. So we took a di completely different place and we took, we drew every a layout and we discussed. We are cluster committees. We discuss with them. We try to give increase in width in roads, for example. All these kind of layouts were discussed because some of the people moved into the new villages. So those houses became free, which means that land becomes a public land because they are getting a new house and a new land in the new village. So what we did is we tried to reallocate it, convert it into place spaces. So all these changes of each of the dialogue is what we did as part of the process. It was a constant dialogue which was there. And even when we did the new layout of the villages, we gave them two options, but they chose the gridiron layout. And uh, uh, see, before the we go with the plan and give them the, I mean, these are our social working team working, uh, going to each of the houses. They don't have to come to our office. And uh, they, dis they come to our, I mean, uh, for each of the family, we had discussions with the fishermen. In Taragambadi, there was a Muslim community as well uh, who were affected by the uh, tsunami tragedy. We had training programs where we explained to them how we are constructing the houses. So this is our training center, which I mentioned. This is uh, Mr. Ayesegar, who is the head of the our social service, uh, social uh, community, social division, talking to the community. Each house we made a plan we told them how they are going to extend their houses because if somebody wants to extend their houses we did not and they say i'll be extending towards the bedroom then what we did uh, you are you have to they have to put a door we did not construct the houses so we gave them that choice of the adding the construction and uh, we had a database for each of the family everything was in computers when we started the construction we found them coming and do pujas because this is part of the traditional systems because each plot was allocated so we ensured in the process this is what i meant by the process ensuring the involvement of the people in tamil nadu in kerala in india putting the front door is a very important function and when the house doesn't belong to them they don't do it but here we found that they want to do a puja when the front door is done. They used to come and visit our site. I mean, they use, I mean, we, we uh, so, so you can hear, you can see they are putting the front door and curing was their responsibility because we gave a water tank and this thing, which later on became the rainwater harvesting tank. And uh, we said that don't blame if the contractor doesn't put in cement. We told them how many rain for roads have to come in as slab concrete how much cement has to be added when a column is cast, how much uh, bags of cement is required for a slab to be made. So we and we told them it is the cluster committee's responsibility to make sure because we can't, engineers, 25 to 50 houses, we allotted an engineer. Construction is happening in various places out of those 50 houses. He has to go and look after all these houses so we told them they took the responsibility, we gave them a choice of color, we gave them a choice of plan, we gave them even an alternate technology of doing with rammed earth technique. We introduced the smokeless towels because these people use firewood. Most of these people are using firewood. So we just told them, we gave, put some samples in their existing houses and we have each, we had training programs, each of the house owners have to undergo training programs and when they come to our training center, we had a stout up there. And uh, but the, but the function is that we make tea and one of the housewives who was one of the beneficiaries used to cook for the for the. We constructed these rainwater harvesting tanks using the ferro cement technology. Uh, and uh, we gave one tank to each of the house because one of the major problem is curing in while these houses are done. So these houses are filled with tanker lorries and it is the responsibility of the, because the contractor doesn't take curing seriously. So we gave these tanks and this became the rainwater harvesting tanks. We did a lot of competitions among them. We took them to places where alternate technology is practiced. We did the socioeconomic study and the construction came up in a very faster way. Although no big contractors, we employed labor contractors. We had testing equipments. We showed them how how important we showed them a concrete cube, uh, cube or concrete block which is put in water for 28 days one which is not put in water we showed them the difference in strength 
which they do. We produced a manual which is published in the local language, uh, even while the construction is going on, so that they understand how to ensure the quality of construction, because that is what is makes the thing. We had uh, each cluster, we had put up boards, which says how many, what is the different stages of construction, how many, wow, what says. So everybody knows what is happening. It was a, uh, I mean, a lot of responsibilities were given to cluster committees. I mean, they don't have to come to the office. They are cluster meetings. If they had an issue at site, somebody complaining, cluster committee meetings were had. I mean, it is done at a cluster level, nothing to do with the, although the main office is functioning in the same village, they can solve many of the things at the cluster villages. And uh, the, I mean, this is again a photograph. We are raising all, you can see that we raised the land because we did the control survey of the entire land. We don't want a future flood comes, future cyclone comes, future tsunami or the same intensity comes, this village will not be flooded or affected. I mean, you can see the raised portion, the houses coming up. And we did an entire study of the area. We found there are old drains and canals in this place, and uh, which is completely in disuse, but constructed 100 years ago or 50 years ago, we tried to trace them. And we found that that is one of the reasons for flooding. So we tried to do the water management of the new site because we had to divert the water for the entire site. Because I told you, I mean, this is a photograph of the new site. I mean, what you see on the left is where we had constructed the new buildings, this, uh, this thing. So we had to raise it. But at the same time, huge amount of water is coming. It is 1,000 houses. We had to take care of the diversion of water and all those things. So we took all these steps, made all these studies. I'm not going deeper into it. We made a huge rainwater harvesting dam. As I told earlier, there is the groundwater is salty. And the government has promised that they gave drinking water. They gave drinking water, but we wanted to have an alternate rainwater harvesting tank. So if that doesn't work, then it will complete. We said there are historic buildings, which we tried to study about the historic buildings. As I tell, Chankobar is a Danish settlement. There are a lot of historic, but the traditional Danish settlement came up in a raised area. So most of the houses in those areas were not affected by tsunami, but we still we integrated the old village with the new village because it was done as part of a master plan exercise. The roads were wide enough because the, although it is fishermen houses, they don't own cars. We've made the roads wide enough. They can buy, if they buy cars tomorrow, they won't have to shift into the area. So you can see the rainwater harvesting on the left-hand top side with the plan. The village was completed. I mean, this is just before completion. And these are some photographs. We did not do compound walls. I mean, this is 10 years down the line. I went to the place again, and the roads are concreted. They have built compound walls. You can see the old houses. And this is the play area, which we have kept for the one village, like in the cluster. And you can see that we had constructed separate staircases, outside staircases. So even if a tsunami of a much higher intensity comes, they will be able to climb to the terrace and save themselves. There will not be any loss of human casualty. And uh, I mean, you can see all kinds of extensions they have made because when we did the initial survey about uh, 50, 60 person told that they will be extending the houses. So we, we now when we go and look at the village, we don't distinguish what kind. See the process which we did the houses create an ownership feeling among the villagers. They did not look up to the government for any repair of their buildings. They took it as their own buildings and they, it has become a, many of the similar villages, when there is a leak occurred, they look towards the government to repair it or look towards the panchayat to repair those buildings or local bodies to repair. In our case, it was not there because we told through the process and the social process, social workers process, we told them very clearly it is their responsibility. You can find fancy houses like this and which we are very happy because they saw it as an asset. Now, if you go there, you will find that many of the houses have undergone changes. And uh, I'm just saying that there are a lot of studies done on the, this village. Two books have been written on this project. And uh, this is one of the things which is there, Tarangambadi, which is there, the dark gray, a German architect did a book on uh, these projects and the role of involvement and responsibilities of architects. She has found that Tarangambadi, this project is way ahead of the other villages where also there were architects. I'm not saying we did a great thing. Shanmuganavar also there was an architect. Kira Chakudi also had an architect, but 
the kind of we were much better in terms of the parameters because we were able to dialogue with the beneficiaries and people and i'm just showing some projects some houses which in the same village in chinangudi the entire projects were not done by us uh, because some of the houses the money the ngos ran out of money the cost escalation happened like any other things sarvas and prices went up cement prices went up so some of the houses were constructed by the government through the contractor system and this is what you see same time constructed by the government in the same village same community but uh, some uh, so government would have constructed about out of the 530 houses government would have constructed about 200 houses and this is what you see in the same village so it shows a huge contrast which is there there has been uh, between the uh, process which we followed and what the government followed you can see a huge contrast between the two villages we did there were a lot of issues it was not easy to do customization allocation of the plots beforehand was difficult i mean especially i mean because everybody has to choose their houses they cannot change it the community in general was happy but the leaders of the community were not happy because once the houses are allocated their control over the process is gone i mean otherwise the head of the the panchayat heads and those people they decided so many things and uh, we wanted the community to get involved even in execution there were problems because the fisherman community the as i said earlier they were not architecturally literate they will come and discuss about so many changes which they wanted to do in this project so they used to come and what we we our team took it as a challenge when I mean, the social team the engineering team and the, all these people took it as a challenge made the changes and made them trying to make them happier we try to treat the treat muttuvel or muttukumari or muttulakshmi or uh, whoever were there we were treated them as individuals we did not treat them as house number 5 house number 25 house number 55 no we treated them there was a kind of interaction which with them and uh, what we have realized it was not a technical problem we tried to solve it was a social issue it was a cultural issue and uh, we try to look at uh take their opinion also into account which is what which made and uh, some of the policy implications of this is that house owners are not able to make their decisions so it is very very important that the professional input from architects and engineers come into a disaster reconstruction project but they have to get involved in the process as well not in the product alone and also another thing is that vernacular architecture should be given a prominent uh, place uh, when it comes to the choice of technology we try to address some of the problems of the uh, public housing projects some of the drawbacks of the public housing which we try to address because every house looks the same uh, kind of thing we took into account the requirements of the beneficiaries the social requirements cultural requirements some wanted attached toilets some did not want attached toilets so all these things we try to look into the into the into the thing and the approach that we followed help the community in participating in the construction process and it led to the high side that is what the german architect study shows which came out as a book there is another book also written by another sociologist on the tarangambadi there were two books which came out of this project what has happened as a result is that there is much greater satisfaction among the beneficiaries they are happy with the products which they have got they try to see it as an asset the lessons learned from this is very clear architects need to take a role beyond the role of designing buildings alone that is very important the professionals have to take a different role when it comes to disaster reconstruction of course they have to pay the they have to be compensated in terms of the fees or any of those thing but i let me say it is not a very high fees or any of those things uh, it is there the process is also equally important it's not the end product which is important what has happened in our project a sense of community feeling has been created a sense of place as a that has been created they became proud of their village they became proud of their town and we try to integrate the new and the old settlements we try to make both the things old settlement as well as the new settlement disaster to a future flood or a future cyclone or a future tsunami 
and when you go back to the village now you can see that there is a huge difference in terms of the uh, many of the neighboring villages and this and now you go there you won't realize that it is a poor people settlement uh, i showed some examples of the houses which has undergone drastic changes so this is what i was just for i mean uh, as i said earlier architects have to take a role beyond their traditional role of designing buildings it is more they have to get involved in the entire process and make sure that the beneficiaries each of these unknown beneficiaries or unknown uh, people have to be seen as individuals and it had to have a, a, and these things had to uh, be based on a one to one dialogue which is which is supposed to happen and that's the the last slide i mean uh, so i'm open to any questions sorry it might have taken a little bit longer than what i had imagined i just try to i'm trying to sh stop sharing the screen okay okay so so this uh, is thank you very much sir it's indeed a very very uh, knowledgeable presentation for all of us thank you very much sir yes indeed uh, kerala and nepal flood flooding it's all similar we can feel uh, feel the same pain yeah the intensity may be different sir and after 2015 nepal earthquake we saw we also feel the same thing they have if we are still in reconstruction phase yeah indeed it's a long long process and yeah, yeah um the, uh, and we can really feel that being an architect into the reconstruction uh reconstruction phase really brings the essence of the area uh we have tried it doesn't mean that we haven't tried uh, to, uh, the uh tried ha had been done from different various level from government private every sectors but it still the it still the identity of the area could be felt by an uh, architect and could be resembled in, in it in the design definitely that was a very very inspiring presentation for all of us sir uh, showing us a really great path in the disaster management as our role that's a um, really great thing for us thank you very much for uh, for your valued presentation over here sir and uh, definitely it's it's it is said that earthquake does not kill people building do and if we design the building in this context considering community considering vernacular architecture considering earthquake resistance technology definitely we will come up with a very good result we will be prepared for forthcoming disasters also and uh, like you said uh there after the drawbacks of the reconstruction was the matchbox like appearance of the housing projects yes that was exactly happening and that's a really sad part too so after this presentation definitely a uh, role of architect will be enhanced and in because we are like getting the wake up call from the earthquake time and again <laughs> in nepal and so this will this presentation really insisted us in uh feeling the responsibility towards uh, maintaining the local architecture so that we can be prepared now for the tomorrow thank you very much sir and uh, we have really yes uh, sir are you like do you yeah. want to say something are you are you telling no, no you can ask any questions if yeah, yeah. okay yes sir there there are uh, questions over here from this kumar karki what he is asking he has a three question okay what is your architectural strategy for kerala flooding and he he again asked why didn't you make house on sales post to keep house away from flooding only house on first floor first floor uh, okay and and there is one more one more question and uh, what he is asking is uh you play a teach, a teacher or coach role to the villagers what is strategies you play to minimize the knowledge gap between the villagers and architect what architecture supply driven or villager de demand driven okay okay i'll take a uh, one by one question yes, yes sir yes sir uh, one is that uh, the first uh, uh, two questions is related with the kerala flooding mm -hmm. uh, 
you see, uh, uh, if you look at the Kerala, uh, the housing situation is far better than most of the other Indian states because Kerala is the most literate Indian states. Kerala's life expectancy is very much our uh, infant mortality rate and many of those uh, parameters is very much equivalent to that of a highly developed country like US. Uh, and many economists, famous economists have tried to say uh, Kerala's model for development because the per capita income of an average Keralaite is much lower than that of the average India. But still Kerala fares much better in terms of the social security measures, including the housing thing. The problem is much less severe. The number of kacha houses or the poor quality houses, the percentage is much less in Kerala. Now, but Kerala faced this flooding issue in 2018. And uh, one of the reasons for this flooding issue coming is, I think it is very much linked with the climate change and global warming. Uh, heavy rainfall during a short spell of time. The dams were overflowed, I mean, so, the, uh, the, so, uh, so the floods came. And land, it came along with the landslides also. Many times landslides and floods come together. Uh, I mean, Nepal, I don't, uh, I think it will be a very, very similar kind of situation. So what has happened in Kerala is this situation where people have constructed houses in locations where it should, never, it should never have been constructed. Or 100 years ago, they did not construct houses in flat plains because floods were very common. Now with the construction of the dams for irrigation and power generation, hydroelectric power generation, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, floods became less. But what happened is that people started constructing houses in low lying and uh, so it became, I mean, a lot of the low-lying areas were filled up. A lot of the areas which were high, I mean, hills were flattened to fill up the low-lying areas because people thought that living near the rivers gives them a much beauty or the landscape is much better or the much better setting for the house. So all these things combined together it, but it's a mistake which has already been committed. It is not right to say that all these houses should be demolished and constructed again with the flood preparation measures. That is not the right strategy to be done. So the strategy or the architectural challenge which I tried to tell was mostly, how can we convert the existing houses so that, uh, in, if a similar flood comes next time, how can we make less damage? So or they don't get stranded in certain areas for food or they, they can shift some of their better quality, better expensive things to a higher level. So if it is a single story house which has flooded, there are many single story houses. So I said, one room can be constructed, which can be one part of the house, new part can be constructed, which is single story in the ground floor and first floor. So two stories. So which means if a flood comes, we should, they should be able to shift to the first floor. And I was just trying to give various mitigation measures, simple measures, if you have solar panels, because one, one of the things which happens is the power will be completely disconnected once the rain floods come, there will not be any power. So what happens with the power? The cell phones or the mobile phones will not work for a long time. So it is always important if you have a solar panel, even during rains, it will work. So you can generate some power, it can charge your mobile. And it's very, very important to have a water tank because the, the one of the other things which is supply will be completely cut off. Supply, because the water supply. Because the power is not there, water supply is not there, and the drainage water and the water supply water, everything gets mixed up. The wells cannot, my wells also becomes difficult to use because the water, the water level, uh, level go above the well. So what I was trying to do is to have a rainwater mechanism, or harvesting mechanism system, because the rains are there. It doesn't disappear in a day. Some rains will continue to be there. So collect the rainwater and use it, even if you survive in the first floor. So a small terrace, where you can still collect the water tank uh, 
uh, I mean, so rain was so this. You can have a 500 liter tank or 1000 liter. 500 liter tank is more than enough. Collect the rainwater and make sure that that tank is kept in a place where it is not going to get flooded. So I was suggesting some measures like this, so which which is trying to do. And when it comes to new houses, better not to construct houses in flood plains areas, which are susceptible to floods. Building the house on stills is one problem because the ground floor can be used for various things. See so the, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, so I was just trying to give us some suggestions because the government published the my the book which I wrote during the 2018 floods, the government published it as a book. I mean, it's published in the local vernacular language, Malayalam, but the English version is there in my website, which I've tried to give. So, uh, so it is possible to uh, do these things, uh, uh, do these measures is what I try. You have to look at things in a holistic manner. And that is, uh, uh, that is what is very, very, that is what is very, very important thing to do. So, so, but this is what more or less what I try to do is to look at, uh, look in a holistic manner. I mean, there might not be a single solution. There might be many solutions, but we have to debate on what is the best solution and then try to work. And coming back to the third question, whether it's a teacher coach role, which you are taking and what strategies I do. See, architects and engineers are very bad in communicating in many of those things, especially communicating with the villagers. That is why in, when we had to do the Trankobar or the Tarangambadi tsunami rehabilitation projects, we hired professional social workers, those who studied master of social work. In India, we call it MSW, master of social work. We hired them because they know how to dialogue with the community. It is very difficult for us. I mean, of course we had a dialogue. I mean, we used to meet them, architecture team also met them, but we use the social workers in a bigger way. We try to see things in a professional manner. manner. Uh, but if you ask me, of course we had so many training programs. We had to train the engineers and architects and the social workers on the process. So uh, uh, I had worked on two, earthquake rehabilitation projects earlier. So in this project, the lessons I learned from the earlier two projects, earlier pro two projects was also, I was very closely involved with the reconstruction. So many of the things where I found, where I failed in the first two projects, I tried to implement it here because the lessons learned are very important in one of the drawbacks of the present scenario. Many people learn many things, but it doesn't get shared. Um, of course, the academic circles, some articles and papers come, but the people who are at the who are in the practical side, I'm a practical man. I don't, I'm, although I write about some of my thoughts, and I always say more should be written, but uh, still there are so many things which doesn't get recorded at any point of time. So uh, the important role the architect has to take, I've mentioned in my lecture talk also. You have to take the role of an architect, builder, engineer, which is the role used, which is used to be played by the old master craftsman. That is what is required in a disaster reconstruction project. They will understand the role language of the villagers. You have to go, if you go in your typical, uh, uh, I mean, shoes and suit and everything, you cannot dialogue with the villager. I mean, we just used to go in a very simple clothes. Even when I did the first rehabilitation project, I mean, I mean, you know, every architect when you do a project, especially sponsored by corporates or companies, you go and stay in star hotels, and that is where you make a get a hire a car and go to the village. After some time, we realized that is not going to work. So we stayed in the village. I stayed in tents in the village. Not only we, me, the, it was sponsored by the Malayala Manorama newspaper. I mean, they collected money from the reader. The general manager who always stays in five-star hotels also stayed in the tent along with me. This is what we did. And this is very, very important. The villagers should feel that you are part of their thing. So that is why I said, I closed on my Chennai office, all the drawings, everything was made in the village by hiring. A, we rented a house and we stayed there. 
10 day team where i showed you the coffee shop or the canteen i mean because I, our team was quite big more than 100 people so you have to dialogue with them that is very very important to uh, very very important to do dialogue with them so you have to be one among them it's not very easy but it has to be done you have to win the confidence of the villagers which is not very easy if you go as a city architect or the architect if you think that you are you are the decision maker then it will not work i don't know how to do it you just start doing it it will work you make changes okay so okay thank you thank you very much sir for such a practical answer indeed yes definitely knowing the community is very much of holds very much importance and we are we have definitely seen the examples that uh, sir has uh, presented just before and yes knowing the community is the hardest task and the best task for designing anything so local and so close to them thank you very much sir for your uh, thoughtful answers now uh, i would uh, there are many more questions but before that uh, let me humbly request our former president of sona senior architect uh, bharat sharma sir to kindly appear on the screen and uh, share his thoughts with you with baby sir sir bharat sir may i request you to be to be here Thank you. Namaste, sir. Also. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it okay. was very interesting deliberation. Quite a uh, food for thought also. But having said that, he talked a lot in my naive and we. We. I would like to. Uh, him to elaborate on his human and human rural culture. I think it is breaking. Also, so it takes. I saw the traditional was there. So how do you approach? What do you mean by the departure in architecture? Sir, uh, excuse me, sir. Your voice, your voice is breaking, sir. Excuse me, sir. Are you hearing me? Uh, my voice. Uh, your your voice is clear, baby, sir. It's clear. <laughs> That other voice is breaking. Ah, it was not audible. Yes, it's it's not uh, clear, sir. So would you uh, please kindly repeat uh, your questions again for baby, sir, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So please kindly put it, put on your thoughts again. Sir, you are you are you are on mute, sir. Pardon, sir. You are on mute. Can you unmute your mic, sir? Okay. Uh, let's let's wait for a few minutes for him. I think the internet connectivity might not be good. This connection might be bad. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hello, Benny, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're there, right? Yes. Uh, maybe yes. There is some internet connection problem. We can again connect to Bharat, sir, again. So yeah. to 
Then uh, we will be taking one more question from uh, Megha uh, Powdell. Uh, she writes, thank you so much for this educating presentation. It was great to learn about the project. I have a couple of questions. What was the timeline of the project? How long after the disaster did the project start and end? How was the project funded? Mainly through the government and NGOs? Okay, I'll try to answer that question. You see the tsunami occurred on 26th December 2004. What happens in the ne next three, four months is the disaster relief, immediate relief measures and the temporary houses. So I understand that this has happened. So I think it would have been till about March, April. I make my sci first site visit in April because the government has to bring out a policy, what should be done, because till then it was the immediate relief measures. So. The government, I think, might have produced the government order by March 2005. So April, I'm in position. Uh, it was a local NGOs, South Indian Federation of Fishermen Societies, who already had a present, presence in the area. That's a fisherman cooperative society. They have nothing to do with housing. They have nothing to do with uh, uh, disasters. But they knew what the fishermen wanted. They used to work as a marketing society for the fishermen. So that was them. The international donors were Swiss Red Cross. Philips was there. And, but most of the funds came from Philips, uh, Swiss Red Cross. And uh, I visited the site in April, tried to work out a plan because I just wanted to see what kind of damages happened. I visited lot of villages, so I didn't get time to show those slides. I found that the elevation is more important than the distance from the sea, where the government order talks about distance from the sea. Even if you are 100, 200 meters from the sea, if you are not elevated, you are still liable to the water damaged by this thing. And the government did not look. The government just thought that relocate the village away from the sea will make. But traditionally, people used to settle in the high areas of the villages, sand dunes, because that is why I showed in the existing settlement, the central area was not affected. So, but then the community is very restless. They have to be rehoused. They have lost their houses. So what we did immediately drew up the plans of the sample houses, seven houses. So we drew up the plans and we constructed it immediately. So this construction would have been finished. So we started our work in the field in June, 2nd June. So within the next three months, by that time we were ready with the model houses. Next three, four months were the time for reconstruction of the construction of the model houses so that people can see. So they could see something coming up. And we used the time for constructing the model houses, which was three, four months. We used it to do our studies. Because you see, it is very difficult for the government to understand why we are doing the studies. Their answer is, why don't you start the construction? But within a few months, the community realized our intention. The government also realized our intention. So in Tarangambadi village, which was a bigger settlement, uh, uh, after one year, one and a half years, uh, NGO ran out of money because the construction costs went up higher than what was uh, foreseen. Um, uh, the, uh, the government said, we will construct houses for you. By that time, government has the World Bank funds. World Bank came forward and said, we will give funds for the reconstruction. The government had the funds, government said, we will do the construction, but villagers objected to it, saying that we don't want government houses, we want only houses constructed by SIPs, which showed that the process, the confidence people had in SIPs, which was the local NGO, and the confidence they had in the process, which we followed for the reconstruction phase. And so they refused. So finally, those houses were also completed. But in the other village, the process might not have been so rigorous or the, those we, we had insisted on houses being given only to the people who give rights to the existing houses. So I think 
those two in the other village the government constructed houses that is what has happened the people might not like i showed some photographs most of the houses are not occupied it doesn't give the feeling of a settlement and the photographs which i've shown is i've taken it at the same time 10 years down the down the down the line so so uh, so now let me just check the question the, so the project was funded by international agencies but the water supply the roads electricity lines everything was done by the government the role of the ngo was only to construct the model houses there were some other ngos etc donors came and constructed a community hall school building all those things happened the sips was did only those houses for some of those houses we only did the planning of the community hall and some of the government constructed the roads and everything according to the schemes which we had given so i hope i have answered all the points in the so it would have taken about two and a half years totally two years uh, totally it would have taken to construct those uh, the entire village it is a slow process but we try to speed it up to the maximum okay thank you sir yes you answered all the questions of mega ma'am and hope mega ma'am you uh, you got all your answers thank you sir and now uh, here we are with one more questions and uh, from vice president of sona uh, baburam bhattrai sir he uh, he is saying that thank you sir for your wonderful presentation highlighting three principles in housing building my questions are uh, sir should i uh, read the question one by one yeah yeah you, it would be easy yeah yeah that's fine okay okay what he is asking is what is the context that you have studied before come up with the solution you explored this is his first question sir did i make it clear yeah yeah, yeah. okay okay so i'll try to answer the first question you see fisherman community is a homogeneous community they have their own i mean uh, requirements uh, social culturally everything is very very different so before we started doing any design we thought we will study their details that is very important now what we prompted to do this i realized it the participation of the community is very important to be successful that is why that's how we will be able to do otherwise it will become like any other reconstruction project so we try to get them and our advantage was the sips which is they had a they used to market fish basically and they try to make boats for the fishermen so they had a roots in the community so these two things were very much favorable for us and it was a large team which studied and i will not say that it is my contribution entirely at all no uh, i was uh, might be the leader or as the major chief designer or chief architect of the project i did made a lot of decisions but we discussed with the community and we discussed with so many professionals because we were trying to do things which were not part of the norms we nobody tried to do it so we got the support so we had consultation with experts various architects sociologists environmentalists water specialists uh, people working with the community who have a lot of experience so we discussed with so many people who are outside this and we uh, so every time we made major decisions we had these consultations which happened in the village we presented on this is what we are and we took all their opinions into account so it is not just one person work it is the work of so many experts but we consulted them i did not behave like a person that i know everything uh, i will give i will decide what is to be that and also one of the mistakes which many ngos make is that ngos think that they know what the people want but the people want something different this this is i found when ngos they know what the people want they they take decisions on behalf of the ngos which we didn't follow we consulted the community at the lowest level and we decided right from the beginning the community should have a control over the decisions and then only they will have the ownership feeling if we show the make a plan in Uh, in uh, in a nice thing and a two uh, 3d image and show it to the villagers they accept it that is not going to work 
here we try to involve them at every stage of the decision making process which is what led to the success of the project our going was very smooth because there were some some of my friends who told me benny you will not be able to start even one single house construction because we dialogue with every family regarding the location of the house and uh, what they want which model they want but we were able to complete the houses more than 1000 houses we were able to do in tarangambadi which shows that the process was successful but it was a very long process and painful process and uh, that is there so there were a lot of people the situations were in favor for us there was a delay in the whole process because we could start construction only by november december although one year it took i see the, the the they had to go, they had to live in temporary shelters for one more rainy season which caused a problem uh, but then uh, i mean finally the villagers liked our process they had confidence in our process so uh, so we, we are, but uh, the important thing is to have a professional study proper study done and it should be always be an interdisciplinary study and we made decisions based on that and we presented our things in front of expert committee so this is the process that we followed i hope that answers the question okay uh thank you sir yes indeed you answered uh, the question and sharing all the procedure is more clear clearer the answer is and there are two more questions sofim but uh, yes it's uh, quite similar so i'm uh, reading one of his question uh, among it uh, he has asked you do you think the rcc building envelope that you have proposed for individual fishermen merges with the context of uh local materials boundary wall thatch roof and tile roofs okay you see uh, i think i told the tried try to tell something similar in the last meeting but i that will similar uh, that will in the last talk i had with sona uh you see we had discussion on what kind of technology what kind of houses we should have for this process uh for example one of the demands from the villagers was that they want frame to structures concrete frames and brickers and infilling material which added to the cost and uh, we were a little bit doubtful on it because you need to have a concrete footing or concrete column means you have to have an in salt water in the ground i mean water table is very high being closer to the sea uh rainforest if you don't put proper cover the reinforcement will corrode very fast so our thinking was that we should not go with concrete frames and uh, our structural engineers all of us looked at the design said that it is possible to do without concrete frames and uh, we can, uh, that is a possibility and we found that there were hardly any concrete very few concrete buildings in the village as well some of the concrete buildings which has been constructed as part of an earlier housing project 20 years ago 25 years ago most of them have collapsed it within 10 or 20 years very bad shape so uh we had a discussion and uh, with the community in one of the meetings i was there the pro project manager was there um, um, and some others were there and uh, so we said that why can't we look at the option of i mean like in the question why can't we look at the option of timber and tiles for the roof that was one of the questions so we just put for we did not put because it's part of the dialogue one reason for the flat roof is that and we you see i showed in one of the plans there is an outside staircase so if a tsunami of a higher intensity comes they'll be able to climb to the terrace and save their lives you don't get time in tsunami when it comes you just have to climb up uh to the terrace so we just thought that having a flat rcc roof and an outside staircase rather than inside will be much safer because outside staircase the cost comes down so we so that is one of the reasons for going with the flat rcc roof uh of course we put this question see the question is that when we put this one of the villagers one of the fishermen asked 
I mean, the panelist or just like the, some of the people who are part of the funding, what kind of houses are you living in? I mean, this was, or what kind of houses have you built for yourself? So the project manager of the team said that I built a concrete house. Then the question came to me and I said, I've never built a house for me, but I'm living in a concrete house, RCC house. The next question which they ask, if you are living in concrete houses and if you have built concrete houses, why are you not allowing us to have an RCC? This is the question, which I think is very, very valid. When we tell them something, we should also be trying to do something like that. Although um, most of my projects I use, I've done buildings without RCC in, in uh, designs, uh, but uh, the fishermen are looking for them. RCC building is a house with a status symbol. It gives them a much better. A mud house and a thatch house, the status is low, social status I'm talking about. A timber house and tile house, timber rafters and tile house gives a better status for them. They think the RCC slab house gives them a better status. So because of all these reasons, we give them the RCC slab uh, to, to them. As I said, the main reason from a planning point of view is to allow them to escape to the flat terrace. And the land is also small. So if it's a flat building, they can build. I, I was, I've shown in some examples, they have added extension to the first floor. And that you can see that that is with thatched thing, with temporary materials. Nothing wrong because those thatched roofs survive because a tsunami doesn't affect, floods doesn't affect. So, and uh, term, but they also know it, that the thatched house is thermally much more comfortable than the RCC house. So, but uh, they, they are, there is a tendency among many of these villagers to uh, imitate the rich and the rich lives in concrete houses. So uh, I, there is, it's, it's a much, much longer period. I mean, you require much more making them aware of the benefits of the child than this thing. That is why when we did our training centers and the coffee shop or the canteen, what we did, we did it with mud house, mud. We use the local villagers. So we use bamboo as a roofing material. So we used to try to them. See, we are living in a house like this, but that was not enough reason to convince them to not to have an RCC house. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, okay, yes, definitely. Uh, the houses are that we build are not for ourselves. That's that's our that are for our clients and community. And yes, you have been uh, giving this concerning and really fortunate to go through your biography and know these things. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think Babram sir got uh, the very relevant answer to his question. And uh, I think now uh, we are uh, we are here with a. Uh, uh, well, uh, Bharat sir, now, uh, so I would like kindly like to request Bharat sir to be on the screen, sir. Are you there now, Bharat sir? Bharat sir, I'll okay. Okay, okay. Now this is really, this is the charm, Benny sir. This is the charm of being virtually connected, you know. <laughs> we, are, uh, we can connect and we can like, you know, talk a lot and it's really, really good. Uh, okay, uh, we'll be again uh, connected to Bharat sir and uh, hearing from him is a great pleasure. And uh, yes, we'll do that. And uh, yes, uh, till then we'll take one more question, sir. This yeah. is um, Prafulla Pradhan, sir, and what he is asking is, you said that role of architect has to change. I don't think it can be generalized. I believe a cadre of community architects are required. Yeah, I, I think he's, he's right. I mean, every, see, we need architects for doing different, different kind. Architect's role is very wide, very wide, and the scope is very high, very different. But, uh, but, uh, yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Are you there, sir? What is sir? Shweta. Shweta, yes, sir. it was very, 
it was very interesting deliberation, but I, I, I wonder whether he got my question or not. But I have one question again. When he talked about human touch and approach and departure in architect's approach to the society, what does he really mean by that? Okay. Uh, see, uh, uh, I do subscribe to you, but I want to listen I from like, you. I like to elaborate upon it a little bit more. See, I'll just give another example, nothing to do with disasters. In past, in past, in, uh, sorry, past. in past, even Moshe Sati used to say that architecture has to be humanized. Yes. And Are I'll you try talking to... in that sense or something else? I'm a I'm little bit talking in that sense because I subscribe to that viewpoint. Uh, I will try to explain. See, when, see, for example, one example, when Corbusier said, argued for multi-storied buildings. I mean, it's, I'm, I say, uh, he wrote the book called The Radiant City and the City of Tomorrow. In that book, he says, uh, we, we cannot, I mean, there is no point in building low-rise buildings. Let us build, the problem of the land is solved. The technology is advanced. We can build 50 story buildings. And in, in this book, he is telling that none of the apartments should be more than 15 stories or 16 stories. But office complexes yeah. can be 50 stories, five zero. But apartments should be one five, 15 stories. Various architects have put various arguments to it. But I'm just coming to uh, Corbusier's argument, which he has putting in this. And he also said in the book that our roads are not meant for horse carriages anymore. Our roads are meant for uh, cars and buses. And cars will travel at a higher speed. So we need wide roads. And he also said that we need to do surgery, existing historic cities might not be able to do. So this is what he tried to do. And also one more thing he said in his book very clearly, all these apartments should come up and surrounded by forest. He said 85% should be built up. No, 15% should be built up. 85% should be left free as open spaces of forest. He said these apartments should come in the middle of forest. Only 15% should be built up. But what happened? So he was trying to see it as a solution to the housing problem. But what happened much, much later, 85% was built up, 15% was left as open spaces. I might be exaggerating a bit, but not exaggerating too much. If our building roads allowed 100% to be built up, some of the builders would have done even to that extent. This is where I'm saying the human, humanitarian approach or the human content of the architecture or the social content of the architecture, which was there, has been compromised by, I, I won't blame all developers, I won't blame all architects, I mean, because there are developers who try to work in, in a much society social commitment with social commitment or architects who are trying to work in this way. And uh, that is where. Here, what I try to do in this, we try to see each of the house owners. I mean, there were a thousand people, but we made a plan for each of them. We tried to take their requirements. All of the people who were part of the project, we gave them an expansion plan. We asked them, if they don't have money, some, some of them, if we want to expand, which way will expand? We gave them the drawings of how it will be expanded. We try to convince them. In this entire process, we try to develop a skill among the local villagers because once the project is over, I will go away from Tarangambadi or Chinnagudi, but we wanted the local skill to be developed as part of it so they can do construction and they can take care of the RCC. That is why we brought the manual also in Tamil language, which is the local language. So we try to do it in a process that they try to, they will, it will be continued. If you ask me, these are the things which are not taught in engineering colleges or architecture schools. How to do, they might have one paper on sociology, which they might study. And everybody hates that topic when they study architecture or anything. If there is a paper on economics or sociology, they hate it. But here, we just try to do it 
try to see them as human beings instead of seeing them as numbers. That is what we try to do it in this project. And uh, as a practice, I'm mean, in a private practice, we try to do this in all of our projects when we deal with community. So it is not something which we did only for this project. Every project we try to see, think about the users. Even with the builders projects which we do, we convince the builders that you will be able to market your projects or sell your products provided you take the user's requirements in a different way. So that is what we try to do. So I, this is what I am trying to put it as a humanitarian approach. If you are concerned about Sorry. the yeah. My internet goes kaput very often. Uh, uh, you, I wonder whether you answer to my question. You said there has to be paradigm shift in on part of the architect to the society. Is it so? See our approach to the society in designing the conventional approach has is it to be broken or not? Uh, paradigm shift. Uh, if you want, if I am saying I'm not, uh, see, I think there has to be a shift. There has to be a shift in the approach. But many people are trying to, I'm not saying that there is a definite answer which can be given by anybody. I'm not saying that the answer or what I've done is the right answer. I'm inquiring. I'm still searching for that. No, but I do subscribe to your views. I do subscribe to your views. Yeah. Yeah, see, my views are based on my experience and my knowledge. I have not been taught these views. I have been learned under the master architect, Glory Baker, but uh, many of the things which I do now or what I do is quite varying from his approach. So I'm not saying time will tell whether my approach is correct, my views are correct. But uh, our, our one, what I try to show in this project, it is considered to be a successful project by the Tamil Nadu government and various officials. So that is why I mean, uh, at least some people have come to study about our project. If when you go there, when you revisit, uh, the success of a project is to be measured 20 years down the line. Not immediately, no, it is not, your project should not be judged immediately after construction. It should be just 20, you should judge your project 20 years, 20 years down the line. This is what I'm trying to say. So happy to know that you subscribe to my view. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bharat, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful question. And thank you, Benny, uh, Benny sir, for um, answering, answering it so gently and humbly to our senior architect and uh, former president of SONA. So we were in last question, and uh, that was that uh, goes like uh, I'll repeat it again. So you, uh, yeah. yeah, you yeah. said okay. Uh, you uh, this is from Profila sir, and yeah, he he writes like you said that the role of architects has to change. I don't think it can be generalized. I believe a cadre of community architects are required. Okay, I agree with Mr. Profula's argument. You require a cater of, you know, we have all kinds of projects. We need all kinds of architects. There are people who have said barefoot architects because some people have used the word barefoot architects. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, for each kind of requirement, this is architectural education, what you learn in five years is not enough to answer all the questions. There might be architects who think that they have learned everything in five years, we will be able to solve the entire architecture or urban planning or urban design, all those issues we'll be able to solve. There might be people who think like that, but hardly, I am sure, a very small number. It is an ongoing process. So each project demands a kind of special requirements. So when you try to do a project with a disaster reconstruction project for it to be successful, first you have to design what is success. Some others will see success when you construct all the 1,500 houses. For some, spending the money itself will be considered as a success. But here we try to redefine success in such a way that we try to satisfy the requirements of the people who are occupying those houses. We try to make sure that our buildings are durable. We try to make sure that the people who occupy houses are 
happier and satisfied. So each person's criteria will be different in each, in each case. So I agree with the statement that we need a, a new cadre of architects depending on each of the requirements. And, uh, but unfortunately, I will say that in many cases, many, I mean, it doesn't, many of these kind of issues doesn't seem to get addressed properly, uh, but that is what is required. Uh, we required, but that is the require, that is the need of the hour. Many people don't know. So it is important that one person's experience in handling a project is transferred to the future generations so that they get, uh, but I have been inspired for when I did this project, I will tell you, uh, architecture for the poor written by Hassan Fatih, where he said that we should see each house owner even, I mean, he said that statistically, we can say that thousand people are homogeneous, but if you look at each one of them, each one of them has a different requirement. So that is one of the things which I learned and I try to put it into this practice. And uh, there is a big, there is an important thing. It is not, unfortunately, not highly discussed, but the author is quite famous, Christopher Alexander. He has written a book called The Production of Houses. I just learned from that book. I use many of the principles, many of the things which he put forward in that book as an inspiration for uh, designing this village. There is another book called Graham Tipul, another uh, architect has written a book called The Housing Transformation, or uh, that is the book. So there are various people written, you learn from various people, you have to take it to the next stage, and that is what is required. That's how our entire society has moved, our various ideas have moved, and that is what is the need of the hour. I mean, we don't need to change the entire architect. We need architects to do different, different problems. Each one requires. Is like, so five years training just gives a general approach on how to do, do uh, how to approach it. But depending on each, so the approach which I found in the, for, done in the tsunami might not be applicable in a hilly terrain like in Nepal. If I just, somebody blindly tries to follow it will not work. And each community is different. Each terrain is different. The climate is different. Each disaster pose, poses different issues. But what I try to say that what we require is a more of a professional approach. And where I disagree with David Sanderson is that as a role, but with his higher knowledge, higher professional knowledge, that is what is required. But in many cases, it is not the fault of the architects alone. Many of the NGOs or people who are involved in disaster reconstruction don't need the services of architects. Out of these 70 villages, there are some projects where only engineers are involved. Engineers know only about construction. They might not learn about many of these things. So, so we have to look at, I mean, the, the skill set. There is no point in blaming engineers or architects. What we need is higher professional knowledge. That is what I try to bring it out in the, in the presentation. Thank you. I think that might be the last question. Yes, uh, that's the last questions. And yes, we uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for your valued presence and all the questioning, all the uh, answering all the questions. And of course, the presentation, it was so educating, so knowledgeable. And so, yeah, and uh, your biography in itself is so inspiring. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, yes, indeed, we are at the, now to, uh, to the end of the program. Time slipped away so fast. Uh, it didn't, uh, seems like we spent an hour. <laughs> so for at, the, at last, I would uh, like to humbly request our SONA president, architect Andrew Malla, ma'am, for the closing remarks. Ma'am, may I request you to, to be here, ma'am, please? Okay, yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Benny, for such an interesting session and for agreeing to this second session with Society of Nepalese Architects. Now, after listening to you, what happened uh, post Gorkha earthquake after 2015 when the earthquake happened and so many villages were brought to the ground, you know, uh, like things have gone in the wrong way. What has happened has happened, but we can, I, I can still, like, we can still wish our government had followed the same strategy that you took for the tsunami people. Anyway, 
because uh, whatever happened now uh, after the earthquake disaster, we sort of feel like there was another very big architectural disaster. You know, if we go to the rural areas in the hills today, the entire sense of place, the materials, everything has completely disappeared because uh, what was done was modular houses were built without catering to the needs of the people. And from my experience as a private practitioner, you know, I have felt even while designing a small pop private building for a family on the, like uh, conventionally the man of the house comes to the architect we discuss and the plans are drawn but when I sit with the entire family take their requirements into consideration each member's requirements into consideration what I have found is that the result is much more and especially in the long term you know not in the immediate aftermath of completing the house but even after 10 12 years you get these very positive vibes from that particular family or household, and you get a series of new clients coming to you with that connection. So yes, architecture has to be very humane. We have to have that community connection and connection to the people, I feel. So with this, again, I would like to thank you very much, sir, and we hope we can have another session later on as well, because there is still so much to learn from you. Sir, and I would like to thank Shweta ma'am for moderating this session and all the audience that connected with us today. I'm sure it has been a very beneficial session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you Anchu. Thank you, Shweta, for moderating it so well. And thank you, Sona, for giving me an opportunity to talk about this topic. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.